Hello, everyone. Welcome to another virtual Mysterious Galaxy event. Tonight, not only do I have one, two, I have three wonderful authors here with me. First off, I have Jennifer J. Chow. Hello. Hi. She writes cozies with heart, humor, and heritage. She is the twice nominated Lefty Award author of the Sassy Cat Mysteries. I love cats, so I love that title. Currently serves as the vice president of the National Board of Sisters in Crime and is an active member of the Crime Writers of Color and Mystery Writers of America. Second, I think it's below. I don't know how it's arranged on all your screens, but we have Ellen Byron. Hi, Ellen. Hi. Hello, all. She is the author of the Cajun Country Mysteries and has, is a great friend of the store. We've had her numerous times in the old location. Um, as she has won two Agatha Awards for Best Contemporary Novel and multiple Lefty Awards for Best Humorous Mystery. She also writes the Catering Hall Mystery Series under the name Maria. Is it pronounced Dorico? Yes, Dorico. Excellent. And last but not least, off in the other corner, because I'm assuming that's where the camera is, everyone, when they see it. We have Nancy Cole Silverman. Hello. She has spent nearly 25 years in Los Angeles talk radio, beginning her career on the talent side as one of the first female voices on the air. Later, on the business side, she retired as one of the two female general managers in the nation's second largest radio market. But after a successful career in the radio industry, she has turned to write fiction, such as her Carol Child Mystery Series and her Misty Dawn Mystery Series. But tonight, we are here uh, celebrating there are three various recently released uh recently re released novels i can talk i swear <laughs> most recently um on this last tuesday uh jennifer's a death by bubble tea has just released and then on uh june 7th we had uh ellen's bayou book mystery a vintage cookbook bayou mystery book. number one release there we go. Hold on a sec. I gotta get a copy of it. <laughs> Buy your book, Dave. Yeah. And also on that same day, we had Nancy's The Navigator's Daughter, a Cat Lawson mystery also released. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and for everyone out there, if you have not yet purchased your own copies, you can definitely do that still through Mysteries Galaxy, either in store or online, if you want to do it online. There's a link below that says buy books and get signed book plates because also all the authors have been so wise and wonderful that they've submitted book plates, signed book plates that you will get with your purchase. And some uh, have... bookmarks too. Yes, I and bookmarks. It's... Yes. <laughs> if you have any questions you want to ask either one, two, or all three of them, click another link below that says ask a question. I will pop back on later in the program to ask those questions of these wonderful authors. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna go ahead and disappear, stop my gab for now, and I'll see everyone later in the program. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Hey. So, so should we just who wants jump to right jump in? in here? Um, well, I'm going to jump in since this is Jen's um, Jen's debut. You know, the debut of her new series, uh, Death by Bubble Tea, which is really delightful. Um, can you Thank tell you. us uh, what inspired it? Yay! I Yay. love that cover. That cover is gorgeous. <laughs> and the title, I Jen. I think that's very clever. Yes. I'm curious about the story behind that. I want yes. to know. Great. Thank you so much. So let's see. The inspiration, well, is because food. <laughs> I like food. And so this is a culinary cozy, which means it's food themed. It's also the LA Night Market Mystery Series, which means it features a night market. And I've been to several night markets in the US and internationally, and I just, just love that environment. So the first time I ever went, uh, I went overseas and they said, oh, there is a market happening at night. And I was like, really? And so usually night markets, they definitely happen in the evening and they have certain focuses. So there could be some with arts and crafts, some with like trinkets for sale. Sometimes you can haggle the price. Um, and they have like entertainers, but the ones I love the most have food. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got interested into the night market theme. And then I thought, wouldn't it be great to write a book about two cousins of opposite personalities who run this food stall in a local night market in Los Angeles. And then of course, you know, a dead body shows up and they have to figure out what really happened. 
Now, I what night markets? Fantastic. What night markets have you been to in LA? Because I know I just saw on the news there's one out in um, the San Gabriel Valley, and it was like, oh, everything looks so good. Mm -hmm. So there's the 66 night market, which is where the one I originally went to, and it's the Santa Anita racetrack area. And then they had some offshoot branches. I think uh, they have one down in Orange County. And I thought I heard something about another one popping up somewhere like Santa Monica. Mm hmm. Very cool. I think that's something we need to do. <laughs> I know. <laughs> My husband and I were looking at the food. Okay. Are there any dishes that you particular that you've or places or stalls that you've been to that you really recommend? Oh, they're all good. No, um, they're different. Different ones. Uh, so, and I've been to ones in Taiwan. They have um, they have mochi, which is like a sticky rice treat. And what I like are the ones that have fresh fruit in them. So the strawberry ones are fresh fruit. I don't know how they do it. It's like magic, you know, like putting the fruit and then wrapping it around with the sticky rice. Kind of like the, like, like the penny in the bottle. <laughs> like, how did they do this? Um, so I, I've I never understood the penny in the bottle. <laughs> <Not either. laughs> So Nancy, what um, should I guess? Well, why don't we each take turns uh, sharing what inspired our series? I guess I'll go next because I'm. Why don't you now. go next? Because you two are cozy, and I'm kind of along with the ride here. Doing yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of brand new this time, so okay. let you go. Okay, okay so um, vintage uh, Bayou Book Thief, um, which is set in New Orleans, um, was inspired. I developed this odd habit of collecting vintage cookbooks, and uh, not that I ever used them. <laughs> until I wrote this series because I took recipes from my collection and adapted, like brought them, modernized them a little or, you know, adapted them. And, and each book will have about four or five recipes. Um, but anyway, I uh, was uh, talking to a publisher. They were the Berkeley and we were talking about ideas and I pitched them something else and they asked for some adjustments and said, well, maybe it could be a rare bookstore. And then I thought I collect vintage cookbooks and that's something I haven't seen. And um, my collection goes back. I've got some from the late 1800s, but really I love from the 1920s to the 1960s. That's I have them through the 70s and even a couple of 80s, but the 20s to the 60s is my sweet spot. And um, and I thought, well, why not co and combine this, the, the idea of someone who sells vintage cookbooks and kitchenware um, with a, uh, a house, you know, a garden district mansion, and then I throw in um, uh, uh, for a late restaurateur inspired by Ella Brennan of the Brennan family. And then also add the, to the backstory of my character that she's a young widow. She's 28 and she was married to an actor who was struggling, but found fame on the internet doing stupid video stunts. And so, uh, and he expired doing one of these stunts um, while they were being separated, but she still is classified as a widow. Meanwhile, she was working. The other thing I'm very fascinated with is Bernie Madoff. Um, I think I've read everything I possibly could on that because um, when it happened, the day I walked in, my daughter was in a school play and I walked in that morning, I saw a mom who looked terrible and I said, Rona, what's wrong? She said, oh, my parents lost all their money last night. We just found out. And it turned out she, her parents had all their money invested with Bernie Madoff and they were about to retire. And that just like gave me a personal connection. And so I read everything I could about it. And so my protagonist, Ricky, in addition to her husband passing away, um, her boss, whose first edition collection she uh, managed and maintained, was arrested for a Ponzi scheme. So she's left Los Angeles and she was abandoned at birth in Charity Hospital in New Orleans. And so um, she's returning now to New Orleans to um, start life anew by running Miss V's vintage cookbook and kitchenware shop in this garden district mansion that's been turned into a culinary house museum and search for her birth family. And that's a lot. <laughs> I, I, you know, I love this because Ellen and I are walking buddies on Tuesday morning or yes. Monday morning since it's no. Mondays with Ellen. And I hear bits and pieces of this, and it's been so much fun to watch these stories and these books uh, develop. And grow. Yes, well, and and uh, listening to your story, which is based on a real story, the in, the impetus mm -hmm. for your new book, The Navigator's Daughter, is based on a true story. So I've loved hearing that. So tell everyone about that. Oh, thank you, Alan. Um, and, and Jennifer, this is really a wonderful opportunity. I appreciate you having me be here because my previous books, the Series 2 series, have both been cozy or, or light boiled mysteries, but this was my first venture into historical fiction. And the story, as I have always maintained, ticks the writer. 
And uh, this definitely picked me. My father was a, a navigator, thus the name, the navigator's daughter. And during the Second World War, he was aboard a B-24. And when he passed away three years ago, I uh, was going through his, his um, belongings and I found um, a diary. He had been shot down during the Second World War. And we never talked about it. He never talked about what happened during the war. If you talk about anything, it was the camaraderie, the jokes the guys did on one another. And I started to read through this and thought, you know, this is interesting. And part of the part, part of the, the interesting was the interesting part was is that about ten years before he passed, um, my father got a call out of the wild, uh, a, a piece of mail out of the wild from a young man in Hungary. The Iron Curtain had gone down, and he said, "I found your plane." So dad picks up the phone that day, and I'd always known dad had been shot down during the war, but I never really thought much about it uh, because he didn't talk about it. He didn't talk about what happened afterwards. Just dad came home, I was born, life went on. So when the man called, my dad said he found the plane. I knew exactly what he was talking about. And we went, um, he asked me to correspond with this man for quite a few years because my dad didn't have, want to go to Hungary and he thought maybe I should go or something at some point. So that was the impetus of the book because when I found the diary, I also found some of these old letters that had gone back and forth at the time. And I thought, you know, that's the what if that goes on in a writer's mind when you decide what if the daughter really did go and what if she found and what might she be? So that was the impetus for the book. That's very cool. By the way, it sounds like we're doing this in the kitchen of a restaurant because it's, does anyone hear all the plates in the background? <laughs> I do. Is somebody coming <laughs> in? I'm having my household probably with my family. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I was like, oh, I'm getting hungry, especially uh, when we're talking about night cooking. Gardens, <laughs> it's like Hungarian pop yeah. posh. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So uh, since we're celebrating really Jen's release this week, which is so exciting That's and the goodness. first of the new series. Um, so we were going over some questions and how are, and one of them came up as like, how are we like or different or like or different from our main characters? Oh, so, Jennifer, oh, Jennifer, I want to know, how are you? Yes. <laughs> Cause you have two, you have a, two cousins. And so it's like, are they a uh, mirror? Are they both you on some level or? Hmm maybe one's like what i want to be and one's not oh, <laughs> so that's interesting. i have i have yale who's sort of the main character and the perspective comes from her yale Yi, and she's like bookish she at the beginning she works at her favorite bookshop in this you know fictional community eastwood uh village and it's called the literary narnia she loves her job there but she has to be let go of her job which is why eventually her dad convinces her to run this food stall and so a lot of hers is kind of based on like i think my love of books my my personality uh and even like having the dad in a restaurant business because we did run a family restaurant for years while i was growing up and so that definitely is part of me and then the other part of the duo i guess is celine and she is um, glitzier. She's extroverted. She loves attention. She's um, into technology. Yale is, is not. And she enjoys foodstagramming. Uh, I wish I was better at foodstagramming. <laughs> I really do. Uh, I've been trying to take these like drink selfies with my book. Oh, they're so, really like, good. Bubble tea and really bubble tea and and the book and always like, is this the right angle? I don't I don't know the lighting. So um I guess I would wish I was more bold like Celine. But they're both kind of different aspects I think that I've either experienced or witnessed or have around me. Um and maybe like hidden parts of myself. Like I wish I could Instagram more, maybe. You know, it's interesting. You said, wish you could, because I think, and Ellen, you'll probably agree with me, so often when you're writing on the page, it's like being able to be the Monday morning quarterback. Yeah. That side of you that you never really get to present, all of a sudden on the page, it's safe. <laughs> and out comes layers so of you you didn't know about. It's mm -hmm. interesting because I would say Ricky, uh, my character's name is Miracle Florida Lee uh, James Diaz. 
and it's uh the her NICU nurse adopted her um and she was a woman of color and she named her miracle because uh, ricky was re premature and then Fleur de lee is the flower of new orleans and uh she was james until she married a grip who was in town uh luis diaz and then they moved to los angeles and i would say ricky is the one least like me but what she does have i put all my insecurities into ricky um and I gave, I started in the first book, I gave her a mantra and I once there interviewed Shirley MacLaine. I used to do a lot of celebrity journalism um, uh, back in the day. And someday I'll talk about all that. But I interviewed Shirley MacLaine once and two things happened because um, we were at, at the time she had a place in Sutton Place in New York. And um, first she asked why I was pale. And I said, to be honest, I have cramps. And she gave me brandy. <laughs> Second, you know, I told her I had a fear of flying and I had to go back and forth between LA and New York a lot to do this uh, celebrity journalism. And she said, I'm going to give you a mantra. If when you feel that fear coming on, say to yourself, I'm having a safe, uneventful journey. And that mantra, God, she has no idea the gift she gave, gave me because I use that. I've used it when I'm feeling over emotional. I've used it in the car. Um, so I gave Ricky that mantra, but of course I had to play with it and make it fun. So she's much more, Wiki is more woo woo than I am, but she can't really, then she starts to become very much more New Orleans than more New Orleans than LA. Like suddenly the healthy food goes away and she's, you know, eating Mac, you know, you know, crawfish, mac and cheese and, and pralines for breakfast. So, um, so she's really, uh, I gave her, but she's more insecure. She's sometimes it's like when she's inter being interviewed by the detectives, it's like the one time was like, well, what would it really feel like? I'd be terrified. So I gave her uh, some of that, but I also, and now every book, she has a different mantra, but none of them seem to work. She's always at some point going, yeah, forget it. I need a new mantra. You know, that's the fun thing about writing, and particularly because writers spend so much time alone with that page in front of them, that it really becomes like onion skin. You know, the more you kind of think about your character, in order for it to ring true on the page, it's best if you can bring your own experiences, whether or not they reflect those of the character that you're writing about and that they're going through. But if you can bring that emotion to the page, it shows up and it blossoms and it, it you just can't make it up. It, it has to come somewhere from within you. Well, how about you, Nancy, your protagonist? How much, where is she like you and not like you? You know, she's probably a lot like me, but she's a lot ballsier. Can I say that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. sure. She's You're not ballsy. writing a cozy. <laughs> I'm not writing a cozy, no. She um, is coming from Arizona about uh, 1989. Uh, she's been working for a newspaper, the uh, Gazette, the famous Gazette. And she uh, had gotten mixed up with her boss. And, of course, she's let go because, let's face it, who's the bigger name? They're going to keep the guy and not the woman. So she um, is... July in Phoenix, her, her father gets this letter. He says, you should go. Go to Hungary. She says, why? I don't have a job. I need to be looking. My marriage is on the books. He says, go. So she's not a perfect character, but she's determined because her father is dying and he wants her to go back to Hungary to find his plane. Because I see somebody says, what, what happened to his plane? He bailed out of the plane. The plane crashed. Once the Iron Curtain went up, no, none of Hungary was cleaned up after the war. Oh, Nothing but first, Nancy, Nancy, I'm going to interrupt. So tell the, very briefly, tell the real story of your dad, because I think people would like to know. where My the dad truth. was shot down, yes, and as people are reading the book, they say, okay, this is interesting. So much of it sounds true. My dad was shot down in 1945 toward the end of the war. He was bombing Linz, Austria. He couldn't make it back to Italy, where he was headquartered. So he limped his plane into Hungary just over Lake Balaton, and then they jumped out, and they were hidden behind the Russian lines until they could get back and they flew again. They flew again to the end of the war. In my book, he doesn't make it across. He, he, he crashes, he fails out behind the German lines and has to hide. So it was a really excellent re uh, chance to do some research on what happened in Hungary toward the end of the war and blend it with the story of how he got out, how he hid, um, and what happened to him and who rescued him. It, it turns out in the book that two people, a mother and a son, rescue him and hide him in a mountain. And it's what he does to get out from there. Jen, I'm going to take my take a couple. That's, I mean, I love that story because I love everything World War II. But I, I want to go back to something you said before that I think we we skipped over. Um, recipe. There were recipes in this book. Is this the first time you've done that in one of your series? This is the first time because the other, so 
my other recent series is the Sassy Cat Mysteries, which has Mimi Lee, who's a pet groomer at Hollywood, the pet grooming salon, but I don't have like pet grooming tips in the back. So this one, um, I had to put in recipes and I, it's hard. I mean, I well, it's, not, it's, a, it's the hardest yeah. part of the book for me. I, that's what I felt. And you can talk about your experience next, but I was like, yeah. wow, this is like, just like tweaking the recipe and making it like, I don't know, even writing it. I, 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 when I had the edits back from the copy editor, I swear like a lot of the <laughs> editing was like my actual recipe. And it's like, I know. did I format that correctly? <laughs> oh, I've left out ingredients. I left out, I've left out measurements. I sent out, I tell the story, people may hear this, that I had 500 postcards made of the recipe, uh, one of the recipes in this book. And a reader wrote to me and said, um, how much, I'm confused about how much, uh, you know, evaporated milk, because it doesn't say, is it a cup? Is it? And I looked at it and I left out the measurement. So I had to hand write it in on all 500 postcards. <laughs> you know, I think recipes um, and food make you feel like you're really there. And one of the things I had when I was researching Hungary uh, in Budapest, where I actually went to do a lot of research for the story, was the food that is so good because the goulash, the uh, paprika, and the venison, and the different types of food you eat out in different parts of the country. And it was fascinating. And one of the biggest compliments I got back from readers is people felt like they were right there on the Danube River uh, yeah. between Buda and Pest and the underground castles and the history in it. But food really adds such a texture to any kind of book you're writing. You know, yeah. people, I think, are hungry for it, literally. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jen, what are some of the recipes? To tempt us with some of the recipes in your book. Tempt us. Oh, I only have a few, so it's not too many. So one is That's obviously okay. bubble tea. Mm. Um, it's a grapefruit uh, bubble tea. And then the other one is a spicy cucumber salad. And Ooh. the reason for these, and they're cold dishes, and the reason is in the beginning of the book, Yale is, she's cooked in the restaurant before, but she has, um, because she's had so, some like emotional issues while cooking at the family restaurant, uh, then she has a hard time trusting in her cooking skills. And so she's like, I gotta do something cold. Uh, and then her dad, of course, helps her out um, with supplying some of the food. And I think that that's why these beginning recipes are like, okay, these are things that, you know, you can like sort of throw together. <laughs> And so that's what I put in the back. Well, that's cool. Well, for this, you know, I have recipes in all my book, which is a great irony because I am not a cook. <laughs> and in fact, I gave that, there's a line in this book where this, uh, she goes, gosh, boy, be, I hope I learn to cook someday. Because she, like me, that's one thing we do have in common. We collect these books, but we're not really cooks. But um, I had fun. I'm looking to see if I can find one. Because not only, because this is like historical as well as being um, culinary. So I include, I'm going to try to show uh, one that with each, I include a little of the, about the cookbook that, and the recipe. And then of course I adapted each recipe um, so that it's, I would never just put something in that I would never just lift a recipe in any of my books. I always make them my own, which can take forever and sometimes fails. I've done that. I've had to throw them out. <laughs> Um, but what's interesting with this, because I have a recipe, you know, there's one here from um, 1928, or I have a cookbook from 1935, and, you know, ovens were different then. Um, ingredients, you know, things they just list as an ingredient they assume everyone will know about. They sure did 80 years ago, but we're going, what the hell, what? And I always say, there's one like, what is Finn and Hattie? Um, I looked it up and now I know. But, um, and the other thing that I love is that, you know, I bought three, I didn't realize I, I, cause I'm always grabbing the old cookbooks at our library sales. And I didn't realize that I ended up with three books, cookbooks called Thoughts for Buffets. Um, the exact same cookbook from 1958. And what I made me realize is that in Studio City, California, where I live in 1958, that must have been a very popular cookbook as were buffets. So it kind of gives you a, a window into a sociological window as well as a um, culinary one. And I just love that. Now shut up. No, I love it. I think that's great. That's wonderful. So do you want to talk about process a little bit? Yeah, I think that's important. Uh, Jen, I'm kind of curious. This was this was a whole new series, brand new for you. So how, what was your process for this? Oh, well, I came with the theme first, which is the, 
And then right after the theme, I always, with my cozy mysteries, I start with character. It's always the character that comes to me first. And I think maybe that's because cozy mysteries have such strong communities. And so I need to really visualize the characters and have them really almost like appear before me. And so I started with the theme and the character and then I made sure to like um, check in with my agent <laughs> to make sure I was on the right track. Uh, and, and, you, and she's like, yes. So usually what I do is I have um, like a, a rough outline of like what's gonna happen. I'm not as detailed as Ellen. I know she's like, pages i'm in awe of you know how much she outlines but i have a general outline and then i'm a little bit like a, a flashlighter i guess where i kind of have it scene by scene and then some of it organically grows and which is great because i like my characters surprising me in in certain little ways and it, for me i i enjoy that part of discovery or um, discovering wait. roadblocks with the characters <laughs> did you just say flashlighter Yes, flashlighter. I've never heard that expression. I I feel like we we're talking about it maybe on our blog. So Ellen and I are part of Chicks on the Case uh, group blog, chicksonthecase.com. Mm -hmm. And I think some for some reason I thought I I read about the term flashlighter, which is like, oh, see a little bit ahead of you at a time. And so I kind of feel like, yeah, oh, so I do cool. that. I like that term. I think that's Yeah, cool. I do too. Yeah. Nancy, what about you? You book. know, this was this book. I knew I was going to write no matter what I what happened, uh, and I it's been very well received. So I was very pleased that it, it came together as it did. And I didn't quite know it really was that what if because once I found my dad's flight logs, and I actually found his diary, and then I realized that this man we had been in touch with before and lost contact. I thought, what am I going to do with this? And so it really started with a lot of research of what was going on, and so it was a really well plotted book. Um, without being overbearing on the history, the history had to meld organically into the story I wanted to tell so that you were never, you know, bogged down in reading history. You know, you were you were following the character through her emotions and what was happening and, and rooting for her. And so that took a long time to kind of make sure every every plot, every point hit exactly where I wanted it to hit. Um, and I was pleased with the way it developed. There was a few, there was some surprises in there, some real twists where I, I had to go from the reality of what happened to taking it over into my story. And I will tell you, I cleared this with my dad before he passed because <laughs> I knew that this story might come up and he was all, go for it. <laughs> so I had a very supportive father and I liked um, the relationship between Kat Lawson and her father who is elderly and, and at the end of his life. And she takes the most important mission she's got, regardless of her job, regardless of what's going on in her own personal life, and goes back into Hungary to find this plane and these two people who rescued her father, just to say thank you. And I thought it was very poignant. And so I had a lot of fun with that. Well, I guess as Jen mentioned, I, am, <laughs> I just finished a 28 page single space outline. Uh, for my um, next catering hall, I got uh, I, I write the catering hall mysteries as uh, Marie Rico, which is my late Nona's maiden name, and they're much they're set in Queens, they're cozy, but they're very inspired by my own life, um, where cousins ran two catering halls in Queens. Um, but what I realized, and I was uh, doing a seminar for a Sisters in Crime group, we all belong to an organization called Sisters in Crime is um someone it came to me and i can't remember if someone said this or I, I think someone said this that it's like think of your out your outline as a first draft and it was like that makes so much sense to me i mean kensington you know some publishers like kensington and berkeley ask want you to turn in an outline they ask for it and uh, some writers are like oh don't make me do that and they say their outline is not what they turn in is nothing like they write uh, for me especially this i really it's it is absolutely um a first draft because there's dialogue in it you know and i need to, and i think it's from my tv days when you really didn't have the luxury you know if you're writing um a script and and the show has to go shoot in a week or two you don't have the luxury of getting it wrong it has to be right and uh, my writing partner and i developed a reputation of strong first draft writers um which is what you want because you often don't get a chance to do a second draft uh on a show because there's just no time once you're in production particularly with sitcoms so um so i think of it as really 
as my it is my first draft now. So I would agree with that. And I will take that and turn it into, you know, less, turn it into a manuscript. The only drag is when it turns out that I've written so much and then it translates into a first draft that's 20,000 words too short. <laughs> so, but you and, know, that the trick of that, and I think, you know, and Ellen and I've discussed this on our Monday walks, is that if you don't have, that by doing a, a kind of a more detailed outline, it prevents you from that muddy middle of getting lost. Yeah. And for me, anyway, when I look back at my outline, then I assign myself each day when I get down to the actual writing of the book, I'll say, okay, I'm writing these scenes. I'm this one, this one, this one, this one. And I, because then you know where you're going. So you're yeah. not just sitting there staring at the base page, the blank page. It really helps and I you think, move on. Yeah. And I think, you know, people like you, Jen, were saying you like to be surprised and that's fun. And, and that's exactly what happens to me in my outline. You know, I always oh, yeah. say I, I created a workshop called the organics of outline to have in my back pocket because, you know, people say, well, I write organically. And I, I say now, well, so do I. It's just a different part of the process. So all that discovery, you know, I'm having and then I translate that into a second draft, I'll call it. And third, and fourth. Oh well, yeah, and, uh, until I until I finally. Yeah, it's about the tenth. <laughs> but you know, there's still that surprise element because you may be going down into the, this. This I know is going to happen because I've kind of fence posted or maybe yes. flashlighted it. Is however you want to term it. But then there's still that. Wait a minute. Oh, I'm into absolutely. It. Wow. I and that's where. I've had characters suddenly, a pop, you know, I realized they need a new character halfway through the draft, you know, and that was nowhere, never mentioned in the outline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, yeah, I, I can, uh, same thing, because I feel like, Elle, you were saying before, uh, so we're with Berkeley for uh, some of the series, right? And yeah. so then they wanted outline, so I feel like I started to outline more, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. It's still a creative process. It's still oh, yeah. You, mm -hmm. I think people, it depends on, you know, your approach and whatever works. I'm always saying there's no right or wrong. There's what it's whatever works for you. So, um, so I, I, we were talking about maybe uh, what was the most fun part of, of writing our book? Who wants to take that one on first? Um, you know, I'm going to say really going back into Hungary and, and actually having had been there and then going back in, uh, going through pictures and going back into research and realizing, you know, Hungary is, a, is an ancient country and that prior to the war and going way, way back, the Romans were there and the tunnels and the mountains because of the volcanic ash and just the research alone was fantastic. I could have spent a long time there. And but really the hard thing is that taking one hand behind your back, say, don't put too much there, just enough to flavor it um, so that you have a nice combination. It was, um, I think the research was probably one of the most fun things. Of course, the trip wasn't bad either. <laughs> in, and, in and on the Danube, that was pretty hot. That was tough. So I'm, not, I'm, not. <laughs> I'm always in awe of people who write historicals and all the research and the details that you have to get, right? But I was going to say research too, but also in the different way, right? Because I get to do a lot of food research. <laughs> like, this is the great thing about writing a culinary cozy is like, I get to go out and like, research all the food right and uh like i was saying before too even afterwards right i'm doing all these like drink selfies with bubble tea and it's kind of been fun to to do that as well that's very cool well for me it was as always excuses to go to new orleans and <laughs> wander around the garden district and decide which house is going to be the one in my head that i describe and um and i found that and so it gave me an excuse to travel and write it off to new orleans but then also, it's been really fun to actually use uh, some of the books in my collection. I have like by now about 100 oh. books and um, to pick the ones and pick the recipes. And it just makes me look at them again from, from fresh eyes, new eyes. So that's been really fun. So I, there's a question here that I was saying. You know, I'm curious, um, Jennifer, how long did it take you to write your first draft? talking about drafting writing your process how long did that take oh so probably i think it takes me about um six months sorry you hear probably background my kids but <laughs> um so you're doing both months. kids and writing here <laughs> yeah yeah my leisurely pace would be like oh a year to do a but i can't i can't do that anymore <laughs> with contracts um but yeah just being able to Kind of have that shorter timeline to get that's that the magic word you just said contract because you know you when you first start writing or a lot of 
friends I know when they first start writing, they, they say it took me years to get something done. But once you get a contract, it's like, okay, how am I gonna how am I gonna deliver this? And that's really when I became more of a plotter and a little bit, you know, my very first books might have been a little bit more pantser, but I learned real quick, ooh, I couldn't make those deadlines if I didn't plot. So I needed to start plotting along. That was change of pace there for me. How about you, Ellen? Well, I, I know this answer. <laughs> <laughs> I give myself two weeks per month to write the really detailed outline. Um, and one thing I do is like, I'll start with like just a, a, a paragraph of what, you know, maybe beginning, middle, end, or what the theme is and, you know, what's going on. And then I always come up with suspects and what secrets they're hiding because that creates plot. And then once I've had my incredibly long detailed outline, I, my goal is to write a, uh, from Monday through Friday, 10,000 words, 7,500 to 10,000 words. And given that I can finish a, a draft in about um, two months, uh, but then I have to go, oh, I give it to a beta, re I go over it, give it to a beta reader. So I'd say about, you know, four months, uh, four to five months, um, all total. I'm debating whether I have a couple of pitches to go out for other series and I'm debating if I can do comfortably do three books a year i've been comfortably doing two because now it's all i do i don't do tv anymore and until someone hires me and then <laughs> um and so that's been you know my my process so and and i i, I know i've said this before too to anyone who's come that one reason i say monday through friday is that my husband once said to me, you know, now that you're not doing TV and you're writing these books, I see you more, but I talk to you less because I'm always like, I'm writing, don't talk to me. So now I really, um, but uh, so Saturday and Sunday, I do a lot of other stuff. I do blogging. I do, I, you know, I do posts. I do, I mean, I just, you know, you do it all because we're. I think you know, you're I, the I, hardest working writer I know. Ellen. You've got oh, everyone. I know, I know. I think we're all working hard. But I do say I have two careers: Ellen Byron author and marketing director for Ellen Byron author. <laughs> hey, welcome back. Hello, Hi. I am back, everyone. I have some audience questions here. Oh, cool. um, there is still time. If any of you out there watching would like to submit some questions, click again the link below that says "Ask a Question" and submit your question, and we'll see if it's worthy enough. <laughs> uh, first, um, there's a lot of food that's been going around. So to all, speaking of food, what is your favorite writing snack? I like this. Wait, I have an idea. Uh, I'm, I'm like, I've gained so much weight. <laughs> And it's because when I get bored and need to get up, I, but the thing is now I balance, I'll have some chocolate and then I'll have pretzels. I'll have pretzels. I'd say I eat a lot of pretzels. And I try to eat fruit, and then I eat more pretzels. <laughs> Fruits in, more pretzels. I, and pretzels. I, candy and chocolate. I see, I see. I feel like, honestly, sometimes I just have to, I don't, I just have water when I'm actually writing. But uh, in between, I like try to have um, like nuts as snacks. Oh, and tea. I drink tea when I write, so. <laughs> yes, me too. Sorry, this. This little guy's been oh, oh, yes, yes. this is Pogo. He's been wandering around. He's gonna be 16 in August, and he's a little as my mother, the Italian, would say, dundid, which is uh, you know, very expressive word that kind of means a little out of it. So he's I just thought maybe I'd bring him up and say hi, because maybe now he'll leave me alone. Okay. Hi, <laughs> Pogo. Hi, Pogo. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Nancy, what, what is you, your Nancy? snack? Oh gosh, you know, um, I really try not to eat while I'm writing because I've got, I'm going, I have two screens going, one to research, one with my outline, and I usually have black coffee. I start early in the morning. I, I start writing, I start researching and writing, so lots of black coffee, at least two cups of black coffee as I start in the morning. I take a break, I go out for a walk, I come back. Toward the end of the day, it might be a glass of wine. <laughs> I, I might have one tonight. If I'm writing at night, late at night, I'm alone. Uh, it'll be a glass of wine. Yes. <laughs> I will share that there are two things I just can't stand the flavor of: are coffee and cilantro. Those are the two in yeah, California. Really <laughs> home to at least cilantro and second, yeah, I, I can't bear the taste of either. So I admire that. All right. What is it about cozy mysteries that you love writing in the genre? Why can't I go down where it's like in a... Jen, why don't you take that one? Okay. Um, I'll go, but you'd go. Sure, sure. I like cozies because they're just comforting. 
Uh, and it's kind of like that mug of tea. Like, I feel like I can be part of a community, create a community. I just, just love that, you know, the homey feel of the characters and the different relationships and exploring like the neighborhood or the town. And that's something that I really like is I feel like it's a, a way to really um, have hope sort of even when like everything around you <laughs> is falling apart, there's a way to go into a cozy and just like feel better and have your spirits lifted. And that's what I like um, about the cozy genre. And I like the whodunit aspect too, you know, I, I have very fond memories of reading Agatha Christie with my mom and that really influenced me and I think really made me gravitate toward the cozy mystery genre. I think, you know, you said it perfectly. I think there's something comforting about cozies. It's comfort food. And I, and I, you know, I, I get on my bandwagon that they don't get the respect that I think they should within the industry and the community itself, the writing community itself, because they're, you know, they're really hard to write and to, you know, there's a little of this going on because you're creating worlds. I would say it's like, like those shows, you know, like I always give the example of Castle, which has the case of the week and then the ongoing relationships of the characters. And um, so it's really, so that really, I gravitate towards that, I think, because of my TV background, where it was very, you know, you had to do both. You had to create the episode of the week, but then you also had to move the relationships of the on, of the uh, regular characters forward um, throughout the season. Um, and I think you said it beautifully, Jen. And I think also it allows room for humor. And, and I kind of, you know, I love reading historical mysteries. I like reading cozies. Um, I'm, I... I don't, especially these days, I don't want to read anything that will upset me because I've reached the age where it affects my blood pressure. <laughs> it affects my blood pressure. <laughs> you know, I'm going to jump in here because my two previous series were both cozies and the Carol Child's mysteries uh, and the Misty Dawn mysteries. And you know what I did like about them was I had a very a community of people who rooted for each other and there was surprise and there was humor and there was mystery about it. Um, this is my first venture into historical fiction, and this story came to me, and it had to be. So it's 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 different in that regard. But I I love cozies because they make you feel good, and at the end of the day, you know things are going to end up okay. Um, that you may be surprised throughout the way. There may be some characters you don't know about. We're going to do some twisted things, but it's going to be okay. And there's no four-letter words or obnoxious things happening. And you know what? I agree. I mean, Mark Mark Baker, who blogs as Carstairs considers and writes really thoughtful, insightful reviews. Um, he, he drew Joanne Love with Drew's Book Musings. They're they're great, and and there are so many great bloggers. I could go on and on, but he he put a comment here. Historicals can be cozy too. I argue that Nancy's historical is also cozy, and I think he's right because um, one thing about them. And here I'm just this is the book I was reading. I took a little nap. Victoria Thompson series. You know, like I said, I really love historicals, and I think, you know. Um, I don't write sex scenes because I'm terrible at them. And I was taught early on as a playwright that you only use profanity when you can't think of a better way to say something. And I think both of those, those, those are really great writing lessons. Um, I admire people can write sex scenes. God knows I, that's something I, I haven't been able to tackle. Um, but uh, yeah, I love historical cozies. And I and I think Nancy's, yours has that a lot of that to it. Well, I, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not really a cozy, but it is, there is that dearness uh, between the father and the daughter and that determination of the daughter to do this favor for her father and uncovering what she does about the history of what he went through. Um, so I think, and at the end of the day, it brings the answer he needs. So yeah. it does wrap up nicely, <laughs> although I think it wouldn't necessarily be cataloged in a bookstore with cozies, but I, I, I thank you for saying that. <laughs> I think it could, you find it, you could find it on the shelf with historical cozies, maybe. Uh, maybe, so. yes, maybe so. Related to that, what do you find the most challenging uh, writing for Cozy Mystery? And then for you, Nancy, what did you find the most challenging for writing for historical? Sorry, oh, okay. Um, so I put humor in my cozies, and I think that is is difficult. It's can be subjective and it's you have to mm -hmm. tread carefully about things that um you know especially like the dark it's, you know it's a 
generally a murder mystery. So, you know, you have to be a little bit careful about that part of it. And I'm always a little bit like, ooh, is someone else going to find this funny? Like maybe I'm laughing on the inside, but I'm hoping it translates on the page um, to the people around me. So, so I think that's probably one of the challenges that that I and then sometimes the mapping out the whatever the joke or whether if it's something physical map you know kind of having that scene in my head and being able to actually figure out how to do it. Totally fair. What about you, Ellen? Um, for me, one of my goals, and I don't always achieve it, but I really work at it, is, um, well, I have a couple of goals. One is to try to find a way to make people think the B story and A story aren't related and then bring them together. Uh, and to me, uh, that's really um, part of the Jenga of, you know, of what I'm doing. And when I achieve that, is, which I, I try to do all the time and not always successful, but I do try to do, I'm really, that's the toughest part. Like, how do these wind up in a way that is not coincidental. Hallie Efron once said, you're allowed one coincidence, which was also a great answer because I just went through and found, hmm, I have two. And I just was really proud of myself because I solved the problem and made things that looked like they were coincidences, not coincidences. Um, and the other, I'm trying, oh, I forgot what the other one was. Nancy, take it away. <laughs> you know, I think it is trying to make um, my reader feel like okay. they're right there inside that cave where uh, her father was hiding and the fear and the excitement and the hope and then the fear that the hope was gone and then it bring it out again so it is writing the uh the, the um the roller coaster and letting the reader really feel and see and touch and um i was pleased that uh, because of the amount of research i did and at least the comments that have come back from my reviewers that they they did feel it was real that they thought it, you know they could tell the difference between what might have happened and where it was, they thought it was that they were really there so but it took a lot of time because you have to get touch feel and smell you know you need to bring in all the senses on the page so that you feel like you, you hear the glasses clanking in the background you see the waiter in his white uh, apron and you know standing with a cigarette as he's standing along the Danube and or you know come on in and come on in and looking at the menu of plastic and all the foods and the smells and the people touring glasses you want that there but it can't overpower so it's always the delicate balance of moving the story at the same time showing the story and, and wrapping in the history at the same time and that's uh that's like driving an old clutch car. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if any of you have ever driven a clutch, you know what it I, is. You got a clutch full, you know. And I remembered. Car, yeah. I remember the other thing I was going to say is that um, uh, there's always a goal, and and again, some I, it's less in my catering whole series, which is really kind of pure humor, to see if I can make people to laugh and and oh, not cry, but feel moved in the same book. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking to see if I can, uh, and again, like catering hall, less of that, but I'm hoping, and and even so, there's a moment people feel, you know, lots of laughs and lots of fun. And like Je Jen said, well-selected because you are writing a murder mystery and you have to, you know, you don't want it to be flip or, or, um, or, you know, anyway. Uh, so that's, that's my other thing. That's really hard to make sure. Challenge. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've always really wanted to really do is, is I can make you laugh, but can I also make you you you, you cry? Yeah. You know, can I, can I get you choked up a little bit? Yeah. And yeah. And, and and then let it go. Right. You know, so that you you move on. Um, I don't. That to me is a good sign. <laughs> yeah. The one thing I never want people to feel is haunted by something, and I think that's something that I, I brought up before yeah. um, in these panels. It's like why I don't write. I. You know, if I, I'll ask when someone said, I read this great suspense novel and there this thriller, I say, does a child die? That's like my first question. You know, is the narrator a child ghost? I, I once I became a mom that I, I can't read anything that's going to like depress and haunt me, you know, about animals or, or children. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. <laughs> All right, here we have one specifically for you, Nancy. Were there any true to life details that also made its way into a navigator's daughter other than the discovery of your father's plane? Oh yeah, a lot, a lot. Um, I'll let you read the book to find it because that, yeah. that again was part of the research of, of what these young men, and you realize these young men, there were there were 10, 11 men in a, in a B-24. Uh, 10, if the bombardier and navigator assumed one role, 
which toward the end of the war they did, about 50% of the B-24s crashed and never came home. So the, the the likelihood of coming back from those missions is why you have all that gallows humor among the crowd. And the stories that I found from, there's a website where my dad's unit still gets together and they, they converse. And these are the, basically the friends and daughters of the, the, the group that I now am, am friends with and have become friends with. And for years after the war, we used to get together with my dad's unit and go to the Air Force Base every other year to commemorate them because they, the missions that they did were very dangerous. And it was great to get to know these other kids and to see us all grow up and tell the stories to our grandkids. So a lot of the stories that you read in there, oh, they're true. <laughs> yes. oh, that's great. That's so cool. <laughs> now, is there any genres that... <laughs> You're a is there any genres that all of you would like to try to dip your toes into in writing or would love to return to um, other than cozy mystery or, you know, historical? Begin with you, Jennifer. Um, well, I like writing I've, in young adult, uh, you know, sphere. And so it would be kind of fun to, to do that again. And... I don't know. I, I, yeah, I would like to try that. Um, and it's usually the ideas that come to me, though, with what the YA realm are like more like either fantastical or like light science fiction. So I don't know. We'll see. The, definitely. There's no reason why it couldn't be a YA for sure. There's definitely <laughs> if you saw in this room, there's a lot of YA matching that. So you can definitely do it. I, I believe in you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for me, I, I would be, I'd love to write historical sometime. Um, I also, uh, I just wrote a suspense that was inspired by my own grandfather's disappearance in 1933. And that said, there actually is a historical, there are chapters set in the back, past and then in the present where his granddaughter is trying to solve a mystery, but it's more of a suspense than a mystery. Um, but, you know, I, it was hard and I look at it and it's out on submission and we'll see if someone bites. Uh, I got one note that, well, I'll read it again if you pull out all the stuff in the past and just make it pure suspense. But I, I tell people it feels like someone else wrote the book. It's weird for me to have not have humor in something. There's very, there are moments of it, of course, because I can't not have it. And then the only thing that I haven't done career wise was, boy, I've written everything, plays, TV, magazines. The one thing that I never did, I only did once, was write, write um, an episode of a light hour show. And I would light hour drama. And that's one thing I would like to do. Um, tick off that final box is, is be on a, either staff or do a script for a light drama like a Sweet Magnolias or something. I'd like to see you do that because I think you'd be a good addition to it. Oh, I'm yeah. <laughs> and I'm uh, for me, um, you know, I, I like that question. I like that question. And um, I like that coast, but, you know, it takes me a long time uh, to do the research because I, 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 ha I get so deep into it. And these are not easy books to write. It takes me a good year to really get a book together. Um, and so I, I really feel at home with historical. I really fall in love with the whole genre. Um, I like to feel like I have something I can give my reader to take home with them and go, wow, I didn't know that. And then think, maybe, I, maybe I'll find she's wrong and find out, oh my God, she was right. <laughs> and bring out something they might have forgotten. I think it's important. Uh, and, I, and I think it's a way of getting history into the hands of people that might not have been able to know about it. Um, I'm the things I learned about World War II that I didn't know about uh, through the research was really fascinating to me. And I think we have time for one last question. And of course, the thing that everyone always wants to know, other than what are you working on next, but what are you currently reading or what's currently on your to be read pile? Well, I showed you, I literally, I had the eraser came me. I'm, I'm pages away from finish, uh, uh, finishing Victoria Thompson's latest book. And um, and so that's, like I said, I love historicals. And then I'm reading a couple of um, uh, books to blurb, um, A Dead in Gondola by uh, Anne Claire. And I'll be reading um, uh, A Streetcar, uh, a streetcar named Murder by Greg Heron, which I'm excited about because he's a good friend. He's the VP of um, he's the VP of uh, Mr. Writers of America, but he also is a great author. And this is his first. This is a cozy set in New Orleans, so of course I can't wait to read that. 
Uh, of course. <laughs> so for me, uh, recently, well, not recently, but I read uh, Under Lock and Skeleton oh. Key by ah, Gigi Pandian, which is great. Oh, so great. highly recommend it. Uh, and, <laughs> and since we're talking about YA, I'm currently reading a uh, K-pop revolution by Stephen Lee oh. and it's about you know the K-pop industry. <laughs> I'm a huge BTS fan. I love <laughs> them. What about you, Nancy? What are you currently oh, okay. reading? <laughs> Great. You know, anything by Melanie Benjamin. Uh, right now, I think she's a wonderful historical fiction writer. If you're looking for anything that's that really you can trust her and her, her stories, her storylines, she moves you right forward. She's great. But right now I'm reading Ken Follett's A Place Called Freedom. Really love it. Um, I also am a big fan of Ali of Liba Gregory uh, with the uh, the English history era. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a history buff. <laughs> awesome. All right. And lastly, before we call it a night, where can everyone find you on social media? Uh, starting with you, Jennifer. Uh, well, you can find everything listed on my website, which is jenniferjchow.com. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under at Jen J. Chow. That's J-E-N-J-C-H-O-W. And uh, you can find uh, ellenbyron.com, and you can sign up for my newsletter because I uh, do a lot with that. And uh, Instagram, I'm Ellen Byron Maria Dorico. And on Facebook, I have an author page, Ellen Byron Maria Dorico also. And you can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, and uh, my own website, nancycolesilverman.com. Um, I'm on all the social media sites. So uh, I hope you'll uh, pick up one of my books and read. I think you'll enjoy them. <laughs> I hope you'll yes. buy all our books from Mysterious Mysterious Galaxy. Galaxy. Yes. 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 <laughs> Congratulations, Jennifer, on Death by Bubble Tea's release. Yes. Thank you so much Thank for you. sending this up. Jen Everyone doesn't know, Jennifer was the one who pulled us all together yes. for this event. Thank Jennifer you. is- Thank you so much, Jen. Jen Yes. No problem. And, and thank you to no. everyone who, who spent an hour with us tonight. Yes, thank you, thank you for yes. coming. We're so and grateful. we hope we hope you all can join us next time for our next virtual event. And like I said, if you haven't yet bought the books, you can click the link below. Link below. I can talk. I swear. And go to our <laughs> website and order them. Um, whether it be Death by Bulb Tea, Bayou Book Thief, The Navigator's Daughter, all three, or any of the authors' backlist of books. It's Christmas in July. Anyone. Time to start shopping. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, it, That's right. And if you don't know, we are doing a Mysterious Galaxy book bingo. So I'm oh. sure several of these books will check off your uh, prompt for this bingo. So oh, I would cool. uh, suggest doing that. Awesome. All right, everyone. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bye. Take care. Thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. so much.